Welcome to the AQA YouTube channel. To navigate through the video, you can select specific chapters or subjects of the video. Enjoy watching and remember to subscribe. Thanks guys for joining us and welcome back home to Australia. I know you have just got out of quarantine, but a lot of people are interested. Uh, they heard your story before you went to Tokyo to the games and a lot of people are interested in knowing you know what it was like being there was it different to what you expected and um, you know was the competition well organized and how you went in your competition I know listening to a lot of stories uh, watching it on channel 7 channel 7 done a fantastic job in watching and um, showcasing all the games live and also through 7 Plus as well. So on 7 Plus, you're able to go to any sport you want and watch it live as well. So that was great, you know. Um, I've got a few photos I'll, I'll share too with the people. And um, guys out there, if you've got any questions, please um, type them in the chat or put your hand up or type them in the Q&A. So we'll answer those questions as we go along. So... Um, Maybe we'll start off with um, how many days it's been since we've returned because a lot of people don't realise that everyone doesn't go together on the same flight and everyone doesn't return on the same flight. So some of us have been back, you know, 10 days. Some of us have been back only a few days. So what did that look like? And, um, yeah, did you have to go through quarantine? I know after such a long trip, people just want to get home. Um, but... Of course, this time around, we weren't able to. We had to do some quarantine. So let's, um, I'll just open that up to anyone if anyone wants to talk about that. Seven days on for uh, myself, Nas. So, um, yeah, it was, it was good to get out. But, you know, coming to Victoria, it's a sort of another milder version of quarantine. And I guess, you know, on top of this uh, two weeks, we had to do Nas. I know if with the rugby guys, we had to do a, a four-day uh, four quarantine camp. And even that was interrupted by COVID where a lot of our New South Wales teammates couldn't come down. And uh, it was oddly enough with the quarantine, I, you know, I thought it was reasonably okay. I was able to work remotely, but I know Shay with yourself, you found it uh, a little bit frustrating. I know you had some puzzles to help yourself pass the time. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty boring stuck <laughs> in that little cube room for two weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had lots of crafty things and puzzles and stuff to do, um, but yeah, after the first week I was done, I was over, over everything. I didn't, Netflix was my friend after that. Yeah. Do you want to do, a, I guess, a basic rundown of what we had to do in uh, quarantine while you're there? Like what I actually did or what I had to do? <laughs> I guess, you know, we had to put uh, a plastic bags outside when someone knocked oh, the drop yeah. off the dinners. It was 30 seconds wait. Yeah. I mean, they were pretty nice on the first day we got in there because we got in so late that night. They asked what time we wanted breakfast delivered, which was pretty nice of them. Um, but then from that point on, breakfast was kind of delivered around like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. You get like a big knock on your door and then you'd have to um, like wait 30 seconds, put a mask on, um, open the door, grab your breakfast, come back inside. Um, and then obviously like as you go throughout the day you're collecting all your like meal rubbish and stuff we had like um cutlery and plates and bowls so um would like wash up after eating and stuff um but then yeah around um midday you'd get another knock on the door and there'd be lunch um and throughout the day you'd get like multiple phone calls from nurses and social workers and um people of like the hotel asking what you wanted for dinner checking in on you and stuff seeing if you needed anything um and i think it was day zero day four day eight day 12 and day 14 we got covid tests um, I got really excited for those days because I got to see people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Like dinner turned up. Josh would have been very happy with this. Dinner was turning up at around 5.30 in the afternoon. So I felt like a grandpa <laughs> eating dinner so it yeah. wouldn't go cold. Um, and, but yeah, that was about it. We, and um, one thing I know, they serve chocolate pretty much, a chocolate cupcake with every meal. It was just, it was a or, lot of or a chocolate croissant or yeah. an almond croissant. There was lots of treats. 
yeah. which I was excited about for the first few days. But after that, I was well and truly over it. Yeah, definitely. And it felt like there's an Uber bag. Sam, I know we did our quarantine in Melbourne. You flew back a little bit later than us. Where did you do your quarantine and what were your experiences? Uh, look, I think I had a very fortunate experience compared to you guys. I was able to do home quarantine. So I've spent the last two weeks just at, just at home. Obviously not being able to go outside, but yeah, compared to being stuck in a hotel room, I think I've been very, very fortunate being able to do my own cooking and being able to do some training as well at home, which has been nice to pass some time. Lucky. Oh, lucky. And um, <laughs> I can't believe that. We try. Oh, I'm flabbergasted. We must have taken all the disabled rooms. Exactly. And all Stu, the I know you did. rooms. Go yeah. on. Stu, you did hotel quarantine as well. Uh, what was your experiences for that two week? And I believe you flew back on the last flight as well. No, no, I did, um, I did home quarantine. Ah, oh, lovely. So I... Uh, That's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of people that. didn't know that was an option. We, well, well, like I say, the department approached us to, to see if I was interested in doing it. So we, the, the main sticking point for us was getting from Melbourne to Bright, obviously. So we had to give a couple of options there. And we finally came up with an option that worked. And I you know, left the airport, went straight across to airport, the airport hotel and then went from there car was waiting for me and drove up to bright very strict instructions on how that was supposed to happen and how to bright but yeah you know, i was i was, I was very fortunate very very lucky to have got gotten that the family moved out for two weeks and so i had the uh our little container home to, uh, to myself and just potted around the garden and Oh, so you moved home, you went home for the quarantine and your family moved into a hotel? Uh, you... <laughs> they, moved into, they, they moved into another, some, a friend, another, another house. Okay. Friend accommodation, so. Um, but no, like plenty of mates called. Uh, I had a call, daily call from the department that would ask you standard questions. Uh, getting tested was a, an issue for me because um, there was sort of a mix-up. So my day three test ended up being day five. And on that day, I got to drive from my home into Bright to get tested through the drive-through testing. And then day 13 test, lucky to get into, into the hospital and in, to do it that day. So I got, got done very late. So my day 14 um, notice to get out of quarantine didn't come through until 8 o'clock last night. Wow. And today's my first day out of quarantine. So um, today's day one of freedom, so to speak. Uh. Good. Um, Natalie, now, I, th I think you've only been back a couple of days as well. I I'm guessing you're not in a hotel, or are you? No, no, no. I'm in the quietest place in the house at the moment, which is the bathroom. Oh, there's another one that's gone straight <laughs> home. Um, I, yeah, been home only two days. Um, I did hotel quarantine in Sydney, um, and we didn't get any snacks. We got our dinner um, and our breakfast at the same time. So breakfast was ready for the next day so they didn't have to annoy us. Um, and uh, cause I use a CPAP machine, I had to get tested with COVID every 72 hours. And then I flew home back to Queensland now and um, came home without any of my luggage, including my guns. A um, hundred people, missed out on their baggage because the plane was too full with everything. So um, that had to get delivered. That actually got delivered to me yesterday. So well, unreal. Talking about guns, something I missed on saying, uh, a lot of people out there probably um, don't know what sport we are uh, involved in or we were. So can we just go around quickly, um, starting with Shay, just talking about uh, what sport you were involved in? Yep, so I play wheelchair rugby um, with Josh and yeah, we didn't have the finish that we were after. We came fourth overall, um, but yeah, like great experience, obviously, first Paralympic Games and um, hopefully not the last one. Thanks, Shay. Um, Stu, Stuart? Sorry, Stuart, just can't hear you. That's it. Sorry, mate, yeah. I'm muted. Um, my cycles, the hand cycles. So I did the time individual time trial and the road race. Uh, came eighth in the time trial and seventh in the in the road race. And probably the most the most brutalist course I've ever done in my career. It was tough. Really, wow. 
What about you, Natalie? You talked about guns. What type of guns are we talking about? Muscles or? No, we um, target rifle. So I only did air rifle this time. Um, pretty boring. Um, as in, oh, don't of... say that. Look, there's a lot of people that want to get into it. Don't say it's boring. I don't know, as far as guns go, like it doesn't make, it oh, doesn't okay. make it not, not a big bang. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, no, I went terribly. <laughs> um, definitely not a result that I was looking for. Um, yeah, don't know really what happened. The guns were having a party without me, I think. So, mm. yeah, this time. But, yeah, absolutely loved it. Best, I think this is the best games I've been to, actually, so far. So. Oh, we'll talk about that uh, further. So, uh, how about you, Sam? Uh, I do wheelchair athletics uh, on the track. My events are 100 and 400. I finish fourth in the 100. And oh, I honestly can't remember the four. It was not great. <laughs> Somewhere yeah. in the eighth. <laughs> Can I just, uh, on that too, I've heard a lot of stories now. With lockdown around COVID, um, I, I think we, uh, we suffered quite a lot uh, as a nation in Australia because... We were we had more restrictions than any other countries. We weren't able to travel, compete, or even train as a team. So all the team sports, uh, they weren't able to get together as a full team for the last 18 months. A lot of the international teams, you know, they were training as normal and also competing. So we missed out on a lot of that. You know, I mean, we, we can talk about not being as successful, um, you know, um, whatever, you know, things didn't go our way, but there's actually a good reason behind it. And um, because I think, uh, lot, even though Australia was really successful in a lot of the sports, a lot of the sports that were supposed to do well didn't, only because there was a lot of disrup disruptions around training and competing. Does anyone want to talk about that? Yeah, it was strange. I remember the start line for my 100 was kind of having that brief last look across at the other athletes I was about to race against. I was kind of clicked in my mind that I hadn't actually lined up against these athletes since 2019. So it's a long time and not really knowing, like you can see their results on like the internet from what they've raced previous in the year, but you don't really know how fast they're actually going because you don't know the conditions and the track surfaces and things that might affect their time. So it was a real kind of just kind of went back to basic racing almost. It was just go fast. It was strange though. Uh, definitely with us now, as I know, um, there was a four camps interrupted, you know, in the lead up. So some were cancelled, some team members couldn't make it. And, um, you know, even with the first team we played, uh, I think it was Denmark, Shay. So the last time you guys played against them, uh, I think the margin was, you know, five plus goals at least. I've never played um, Denmark before, like as a proper um, mm. full team. So, um, I, yeah, I couldn't answer that question. Sorry, that was the first time. Mm. Yeah, at the same Josh. time now, so, you know, full credit needs to go to the teams because, you know, while we had these interruptions um, or, or players, it, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, we, we were just dusty. Like we were just not game fit. We hadn't played together. We were just making silly mistakes. Plus, we got a little bit unlucky with one of our, like, key player players from, like, a key lineup getting sick. So, yeah, I mean, just unlucky with COVID and everything else that was kind of going on. But that's life. That's sport. That's right. I see, and we noticed it too, especially with the hand cycles and the trikes around race fitness. Because most of the other most of the upright riders in our team can race against conventional riders and race against you know, but with the trikes and the hand cycles, we, you know, I mean, I was in the same boat. It's been it's been two years since I've raced against these guys, and two years since I've raced competitively. And you look across the line, you go, who's going to be the big one out of the you know who, who am I going to who am I going to, who's going to be the the top dog here and. Um, so that lack of race preparedness, I think that that yeah, we'll say um, racing is the best form of training. Well, it's truth in that. So, no, very true. Um, let's talk about our expectations. Uh, as in, you know, we uh, before you went across, uh, the Paralympics nearly didn't happen. You know, so it went ahead. That was fantastic. 
And there were so many things put in place um, to avoid getting COVID or mixing with other people. Now, what was it like actually being there? You know, we talked about bubbles. Um, you know, people were going to live in a bubble and you, know, you weren't able to interact with other athletes. Um, was it, did it work out that way? I mean, was the bubble really, really bad or were you able to get fresh air and all that sort of stuff or mix with any of the other athletes? Someone mentioned it was one of the best games they've been at. Um, yeah, let's talk about that. Well, certainly a lot more freedom than I thought we were going to have heading in there. All the meetings we had before we went there were kind of quite scary. And it kind of did feel like you're going to have to live in your room, go get your meals and go to training and come straight back. But we were allowed to walk around the village, which was quite nice. We just weren't allowed to kind of interact with other athletes from different countries and go to common areas like the dining hall. So all our meals were done in the Australian allotment. But that did create a really good kind of team and community environment within the Australian team. Like having been to previous games, it's definitely the best kind of Australian community kind of feeling that I've felt among a team, which is really, really great. I've definitely. actually got a few photos that I'm going to share with people um, just to uh, give people an idea of what it was like. Um, uh, I'll do that in a few moments, but um, Josh, did you... Or anyone else want to talk about the bubble and, you know, uh, it was actually not like a prison, you know, which, you know, you probably felt like it would have been before you went there. Well, I think, okay, Stu, sorry. Uh, we were a little bit different. We were on, we were on the satellite, satellite sites. So mm. we spent, because we were competing three hours south of Tokyo. And the first hotel we stayed at was in Izu. And, and that was... That was a really, that was a nice, we had, had, had the hope, lucky enough to have the hotel to ourselves. So we had a little bit of freedom in the grounds of that hotel, but we never, that's about as far as we, we couldn't leave the hotel grounds. And uh, we had quite open so the use of the hotel, uh, us being the only people in the in the hotel. But it was still, we're still very much a very strict mask protocol. So you, if you were in your room, it was okay. But if you were going between rooms or between, while you're eating, um, while you're going between rooms, mask mask on all the time between the track and or training track and the hotel, mask on. Uh, eating, of course, no mask. Um, and while you're outside on the grounds, that was fine. And then the second hotel I went to was at Mount Fuji, and it was an international. That was an IPC hotel, and a lot more spending time in rooms. Couldn't go outside uh, right until the last couple of days where we negotiated with them to allow us to go and walk outside in the grounds. So that talk we got before we went, we pretty much had that experience. Yeah, definitely. And just, you know, adding to that and to Sam's point, you know, the hotel itself was a great community, but I, I found maybe the first 48, 72 hours the most intense because, you know, boarding the plane, we needed, you know, paperwork galore, apps uploaded, you know, COVID tests, you know, all that sort of stuff. That was pretty intense. And even arriving now to the Japan, uh, airport you know, everyone was in like a biohazard we have like different stations checking in covid test and yet again three different stations then we'll allocated a, a certain section to wait for i don't know it felt like maybe two hours or so just while you're processed so um that initial um 48 hours is you know, i thought potentially intense and what it was going to be but um shay got a bit easier because it was a daily spit test we had to do it was also filling out the ocha app did you want to speak to that a bit um, yeah, sure. We so I wish they'd bring these COVID tests in to Australia because they're brilliant. You just um, would get like a little test tube thing, and every morning before um, you'd like first thing when you woke up, you'd have to spit in a tube. Um, I think it was like about that much like spit you'd have to put in there. Um, you couldn't have any water, eat anything, or brush your teeth before doing it. Um, and then you just, we would just leave it outside our door for one of um, the staff in our team to pick up. Um, so yeah, every day we did that. And um, yeah, it's first before we were told before we left our rooms that we'd have to fill out an Archer app, which was just asking um, if we had any symptoms, if we knew of anyone that had any symptoms um, and we'd have to put in like our temperature. So yeah, that was pretty much the daily routine like waking up and before leaving the room. 
And Nas, that tracked us, Nas. That thing tracked us. So we had a bit of an address from the AFP saying if there was to be a close contact. So this was initially the biggest fear, I guess I felt for myself, was uh, as Sam said earlier, that we couldn't really speak to any of the international um, athletes. And if you were a close contact, then you're up to the discretion of the organisers whether you're allowed to compete. Mm. It might be a little bit different because I'm more of an individual sport. Um, we like um, we had to go out and catch the bus every day, and then we went off to our venue, which we have ranges everywhere, but it was a lot of outdoor area around there too. So we got to spend a lot of time outdoors there. Um, a lot of time outdoors just in the allotment. Um, I'd do my spit test and I'd actually take my own down. We'd take my own down to the um, oh, sort of semi-medical centre thing just to drop it off. Um, really casual, just, you know, as long as it was done by 6pm that day. No real, no real organisation. Um, like still, we were quite happy. We, you know, all of ours individually um we had you know so many different countries that we just mixed with at the range um and you know you you, you sat in the um common area or whatever and they had their little visors like screen protectors and things so you just you know you weren't closer than sort of one and a half meters to anybody but other than that we saw so many you know different country people we we chatted to them all you know like um, yeah, we had our masks on all the time and everyone was really cool about that. Um, but yeah, it really wasn't restrictive at all for us, pretty much. Well, just want to see, so uh, did everyone stay at the Athletes Village other than Stuart? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, I've, I've got a picture too I'll show uh, to give people an idea of what the village actually is, uh, what it looks like. Just got a couple of questions coming through. Um, Georgina asks... Um, um, are you guys looking forward or going to take part in the pa uh, Paris Paralympics? Um, if yes, what does your training re regime look like? Um, as, as you know, it's only three years away um, because this one was delayed by a year. The next one's uh, only three years away, so pretty close. Yeah, Shoot. people keep saying it's only three years, but three years is a long time for yes, an athlete right. to keep training. <laughs> it's a lot of Ks on the body to try to put up with. But yeah, look, assuming injuries um, don't creep in, I'm definitely going to try to push towards Paris. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'll see what happens with Worlds first, and then I'll make a decision about what happens after that. To be honest, Nas, I was pretty excited until, you know, we had to address our KPIs and you said no. So I guess I've got to <laughs> I said no. <laughs> Stu, uh, what are you doing, mate? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep I'll keep riding the bike. If they keep having me, I'll keep turning up. Yeah. Fantastic. I might have a week or two off, another week or two off before I get back on the <laughs> back on the treadmill again. But isn't it um, people don't realise, you know, uh, you don't just turn up and play, do you? You know, during the Paralympic cycle, you're training nearly every day and you don't get much of a break, you know. And you only get a few days off here and there. But a big load on your like your, your family life, your social life. Pretty much, you've got to give up so much just to be able to compete at the highest level. And I know you guys have well. Hopefully, you've got uh, at least a few weeks off before you get into training. Um, and hopefully, you don't enjoy the break too much, and you do go back to it. I think we missed out, Natalie, as well. Then, uh, what, what's your plan going forward? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go for Paris. Um, our biggest problem is probably we'll be qualifying because uh, Shooting Australia have sort of said that they won't be travelling out to competitions um, through 22. Um, so um, whether we'll be able to, uh, we usually have our world champs um, in 22 and, um, yeah, whether we'll be able to get to those competitions to start qualifying and things like that. Um, so that'll be our issue. Um, getting guns into countries and things is always hard, but it's it's a bit harder at the moment. So, I think um, I think that qualifying is going to be an issue for everybody, depending on what happens in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. a, a couple of things. I mean, air travel is becoming you know, more expensive because of less patronage, and um, and then asking athletes to quarantine again, coming back. You know, is that you know? 
coming back into Australia. Um, so you, know, you think you normally go overseas two or three times a year to do World Cups or World Championships, and then um, you've got to come back. So I think there's going to be a lot of planning around how we gain points, you know, Paralympic points for, for, for 2024, yeah. is it? 2025. Yeah. So I definitely... So hopefully, I mean, uh, you know, the government's looking at uh, once people uh, got double doses, 80% of people got double dose, international travel will start to open up. Um, isolation, when you return, it probably will, will be relaxed a little bit, as in, you know, you wouldn't have to go to a hotel. You know, you, you might have to, as you've, you're doing, Stu, um, you know, go home and do your quarantine there. Got a question from Duke. He, he's asking... Um, about drug testing. So was the drug testing at the same time as COVID testing? Now, they're, they're different. I, I think he's talking about the randomised drug testing by, is it Asada or Isada? That, that do it? Yeah. WADA. WADA, sorry, yes. Well, I was fortunate not to be drug tested. Not that I did anything wrong, but yeah, just not have to go through all that process. Uh, I think, Shay, you got picked up, didn't you, a couple of times? Just once, yeah. Oh, After God. one of our, I can't remember if it was like a training session or a game session, but yeah, got um, tapped on the shoulder and had to go um, do a um, a urine sample, which yeah. was um, weird because that was the first time I've ever had to do it. But yeah. you know, first Paralympic Games, first drug test went up. <laughs> and I guess for the people playing at home now, it can be quite intimidating because they're definitely they're watching the whole time. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, That's if you're right. a bit shy or, um, yeah, it can be quite intimidating. But back to Duke's point, that was, that was separate sort of processes. So, yeah. so I'll just, just elaborate on, on what the process happened with you with the COVID testing, the spit testing, Duke, was that you would provide a sample every morning and if something came back from that sample, then you'd go and get a proper mm. nasal COVID test done. So that was a separate thing. And then... Um, you know, the in competition or out of competition testing through WADA was a was a completely separate deal altogether. And I remember I, I got I was I was pulled up after the road race, and um, so I, I t this road the road race was eighty k's with thirteen hundred meters of climbing in it. It was twenty seven degrees and one hundred percent humidity. Wow. And I took a bottle, it was six laps of the course. I took a bottle, I took a bottle on board every lap. And when I got back and the chaperone was there and said, We've picked up, we, you know, can you do a test? I'm like, Yeah, sure, no worries. And the teammates were like, Oh, you should have no worries because it was, it, was, it was a urine and a blood test. And they were going, You should have no problems with the uh, urine. I'm like, You've drunk enough, you've drunk a bottle every, you know, every lap. I'm like, You think so? So I dropped another bottle straight away, went and I reckon it took me two goes and maybe two and a half hours before I got the sample size out. Yeah. I was that dehydrated. And Stu, they don't leave your side side, do they? Until no, no, no. So, so, yeah. so what happens is that you, you, oh, we we're fortunate that we had our team doctor with us, so he came along as well um, as my representative. Uh, but a chaperone will follow you from the time you are you are asked by WADA to provide a sample. So a chaperone will stay with you, just keep you in sight. Uh, in my case, we had to walk, you know, had to roll down to a to a separate building. Um, then you're introduced to the tester, who will then take the sample. Uh, in my case, I couldn't provide a, com a complete sample the first go, so uh, we had to then we go through a process of sealing that that half, you know, that that half the half completed sample in a in a in a bag and fully documented and then you'll go away and the chaperone goes with you and you'll drink another 15 bins of water and then you'll hope that when you get by the time you get back to specific gravity it's not too not too weak and you'll go back and you'll try again this time i provided the sample and also gave a blood sample for my biological passport so but the chaperone stage was the whole time and um and i was lucky that i, had my, I could have my brain doctor with us for the whole time as well yeah, it's pretty serious, isn't it? You know, they want to make sure you don't sneak away. Oh, of course, or yeah, no, and, 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 and so it should be too. Like, yeah. I mean, it's, I'm right behind that. But yeah. also, is this true now? They have to actually see you piss or urinate into the bottle. That's correct. Yeah, no. they, um, yeah, that's you got to pull your pants down and pull your top right pull up. Pull your top above, up. So. Yeah. 
there's no fake bottles or a, that's right a because fake. people have tried to cheat the system in the past and I think they're it, or they're onto it so they don't say here's a bottle and you know bring it back in half an hour they actually make sure you provide this sample yeah I don't know if anyone looks forward to doing that um I wouldn't no way really I've got some photos, Nas. Yeah, yeah. Not of that, though. Yeah. Not of that. <laughs> okay. All right. Hang on. I'm going to have to find the other album then. <laughs> All right. So I've got a few photos I will share. Uh, and look, uh, some of these are just general photos, uh, which we all could speak to. And some of them are specific related to, you know, our sport or, or us. So... Give me a sec while I open this. Right, I'll share my screen. That's why you're doing that. When I got tested this time in um, the athletic stadium after my 100, the guy that tested me was the same guy that does me locally here in Ocean Grove in Australia. Of all places around the world, this one specific guy from my hometown tested me well, in the stadium in athletics for in Japan. I think so he's got a crush on you, mate. I think that's what we're going to say. <laughs> right. So it's worrying when they chase you around the world to watch your pee. <laughs> <laughs> It's showing on. Yeah, everyone can see the screen. Not the photo, we've got your folders, mate. Yep. All right, so here we go. Hopefully this works. All right, so everyone can see a picture of Australia and apartment buildings. Uh, I've got a blank screen. Oh, have you? Yeah, blank screen. Oh, okay. Why is it doing that? Give me another try. Share screen. Screen. There you go. How's that? Yep. So, Sam, these were our headquarters, weren't they? It's the, the hotel building, and I guess I had mo my uh, breakfasts out here most mornings. Yeah, so you can see that grass, kind of fake grass area at the front of the building there. They had a bunch of trestle tables. So all our meals we would grab from inside and would bring out, and we would have them kind of as a big kind of group together, which is really cool. And that was because people weren't allowed to, like you said, Sam, and go to the dining hall to eat. So there was a special areas provided for just the Australian athletes to have their meals. Yeah, Australia was, as far as I know, the only country that wasn't allowing athletes into the dining hall. So we got a lot of um, kind of jealous looks from a lot of people that we could actually just, at any time we wanted, kind of grab some meals and <laughs> go and eat them out there whenever we wanted. They gave us three options, Nas. Uh, Vaughny, uh, the nutritionist, I think she was one of the main leads on that. And um, yeah, she did a great job. And um, so what was it, Shay? They gave us, was it three options for lunch and dinner? Um, yeah, I think it was normally like a, like two meat options and a vegetarian option. Um, and then you'd always get like a salad and um there were always snacks and other things you could grab as well. Plus, there was always like leftovers from lunch too. So if you didn't want what was available for um, dinner, you could always grab leftover lunch things. Yes, yeah, Stu. What I guess for the next photo, what was how did, was your food delivered? On fact, were you allowed to order Uber or how did it work? No, no, no. <laughs> we'll eat Uber is where we were. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so we were at the first, like I said, the first hotel. We fully catered, so we had a dining room there, and and, and that was absolutely amazing. Like it was a such a, a, a great way to spend the first week. Uh, very friendly staff. Very, very, you know, we, we've got a great team, and they did a really good job of getting the food organised there, and, and that was wonderful. The second hotel though, was a little bit different for me. I mean, some people went down and had their meals in the dining room like in the dining room with other other countries i i didn't so i ate a lot of tuna noodles and a lot of beans in cans with tuna and um i did that everything they, all the emergency rations that they pack for you guys i i, I had those for about a week <laughs> and that was fine i could i can live on that i could i could do that i think i could uh a week a week was enough though yeah 
Can I just ask you now, you start at hotels, you, you mentioned um, you start at uh, hotels now. Was it for all the athletes staying at one hotel? Or yeah, the, so, so all of the cycling group. Yeah, yeah. So all, all the all, all the Australian team started at one. The first hotel we had to ourselves, and the second hotel was a was a hotel sanctioned by the International Paralympic Committee. Okay. So it was, that was with that was with international other international teams were there as well. So that was a mixed hotel. Okay, just um, one time to talk through uh, about the um, the apartment blocks here. Uh, they weren't mixed, were they? So each country had their own blocks. Can we, if we talk about that, that'll be good. Was it? Was that true? Uh, so Australia being a pretty big team, we had most of the building for ourselves. We had a few of the Pacific Island countries that Australia kind of sponsors in our building as well on the upper level. But yeah, it was pretty much just Australia in our building. Some of the smaller countries, they had to mix. So you could see, I don't know, if some of the photos, you might be able to see there's different flags mm. on different levels for where they were staying. But yeah, the bigger countries like America and GB and Australia, they um, are fortunate enough to have enough people to fill up most of the building themselves. That no, was pretty good. And that this was our food setup, wasn't it? Now, I'm easy sold as long as I've got my coffee pod machine. But uh, yeah, you can come up and get your breakfasts and the like. I'll, I'll yeah. throw it to you now. <laughs> this time. Get a coffee uh, or snack whenever you want it. Yeah, I was, I was sold, mate, the pod machine. So um, it was easy for me. Here's one of the, the views um, looking out onto the harbour and the bridge there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it pretty much explains it's a site for the Olympics and Paralympics. I'm not sure if you've got any photos of it, but there was actually a big cyclone fence all the way around the village too. Was it um, really? Yeah, so the people couldn't get in or, and we couldn't get out, but yeah. <laughs> and I was told that was um, sensory, uh, what do you call it, sensory, sensory security as well. So when people would touch it, they'd have uh, the Japanese officials rock up and, you know, and ask what you're doing. Hmm. No, I think that was a myth because we actually climbed the fence to take some photos <laughs> of the... Um, the the, the um, phone tower at night yeah we a really good spot and we climbed up the fence take some photos and nobody came and said anything so I, I think they were just trying to scare us about yeah. they did well for me <laughs> <laughs> no, just we, so before, I... we got told, before we got told about that we'd done it yeah so we, didn't, we didn't try and test it out we just went oh nobody just nobody grabbed us last night so yeah, yeah. Can I just say, like, every country you had were able to decorate their own building and if there were a prize for the best-looking building, it looks like Australia would have had it. Uh, and someone mentioned about some of the other blocks and uh, putting out their flags. You can see to the left of this, uh, I'll try to zoom in, but um, you can see in the building to the left there, uh, that's a GB flag. Uh, so it looks like that was their building. And just going down a bit lower, Nas, this was a general rec area that we could go to. So there was a ping pong machine. They had a slushy machine because the temperature, you know, ranged you know, generally in the 25s to 30s. And um, so they also had the TV screens, as you can see the bottom there, and you could watch the different sports uh, being played out throughout the day. That's where Jimmy Barnes played for us on the, because uh, we didn't go to the closing ceremony. We got a personal concept from Jimmy Barnes on that TV on the closing ceremony night. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. Here's another few shots from the promenade. Is that what it was called? Promenade, Farrah And there's some other good shots coming up now as we can get a really good shot of it going down. Here we go. So this is... Um, oh, does anyone want to talk about what this photo is? I'll let Sammy talk to it. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> um, that was from the opening ceremony. So everybody, we weren't allowed to go to the stadium and kind of have that team entrance. So we all got dressed up and met outside the Australian building there with uh, Riley Bat and Danny DeToro, who were the two team captains. So they were they went to the opening ceremony as the flag bearers were. So it was kind of us waving them off as they got on the bus and went out to the stadium for the opening. Oh, that was good. So you had your uh, um, my mini... Opening ceremony, uh, a lot of people were expecting to see the athletes out there, but 
again, uh, just to be safe, I think only the flag bearers were able to go out to the opening and closing ceremony, I think. And just, uh, just a, a note, quick note on that. Australia were the only, Australia and Ireland, I think, were the only two countries that bowed to Japan when they came into the uh, stadium on the opening ceremony night. Oh, is that right? So that, that's a respect thing, Stuart? It's very much a respect thing. Oh, okay. Well, that's great that you were able to do that. In the background there, I'm looking at that apartment building. That looks like the US flag. Looks looks like um, they were your neighbours while you were there. Yeah, yeah sandwich between GB and America. <laughs> <laughs> this is a pretty cool shot, Nas. No, sadly, it doesn't look like there's much of a crowd. But, um, yeah, I wonder just one of the aspects, how do we feel like... Um, you know, I feel a little bit sorry for Shay, not to rub it in, guys, but um, Sam, Stu, you know, Nat, on your experiences at past ones, I mean, for my first Olympics, the London, uh, it's Wembley Stadium, I believe, and rolling out to that crowd, it's, it's a pretty awesome feeling. I've never been to an opening ceremony. Oh, yeah, okay, it's true then. I've never, been to, I've never been to an opening ceremony either. Oh, I should have yeah. checked these questions beforehand. Sam, save me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, London was my first one, like you, and... Yeah. Um, yeah, that the feeling of walking out with the Australian team and hearing a, like a whole crowd in the stadium, like absolutely packed, like eighty thousand people. It's yeah, it's a really unique experience that you're definitely going to hold on to for the rest of your life. So it does, it is a little sad knowing that some of the debutants didn't get to experience that, or some people that have been previously haven't experienced that. Um, but yeah, hopefully it's something they might be able to experience in the future because it's an amazing, amazing feeling and atmosphere to be a part of. Definitely okay. is, you know, all those thousands of people uh, not there cheering a soccer match or a footy match, you know, they're, they're actually behind you guys um, welcoming you to the competition. Here's another photo of just one of the back roads. I'm looking for that cycle fence. So uh, that's there somewhere, but I, I just can't see it. And I'm not sure if we've got the map photo on this though, Naz. Like it was sort of a mini island on the harbour, so there's water pretty much around it. And um, yeah, so this is at one of the other ends. Uh, um, what do you call it? The IPC Paralympic. Um, I think it's Logo. Logo. Go, Sam. Uh, they called the Ajita. There you go. Yeah. Very knowledgeable. And, and you can see on the asphalt there, so it looks like there's a word missing, but it looks like wear a mask or put on a mask. Just as a reminder, I think, for people to... Didn't work all the time, Naz. I saw a lot of photos with and without. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. Here we go, Josh. This is the photo you're talking about. Yeah, so, you know, it's articulating that there's a bit of a harbour around us and uh, maybe just put the mouse on where our building was. So you're around here somewhere, I no, think. Just the inner side of the, the thoroughfare. And um, so, yeah, as you can see, it's like a little mini city with, you know, all the different nations. And... Um, so I'm always all, so good, us. all that area is close to the public, isn't it? So all that is for the athletes. Yeah, correct. And the one thing that I find amusing is laundry. You know, fun fact, while you're there, so we all have an accreditation, which is pretty much like a passport. And um, where we drop ours off would be at the what do you call it, New Zealand building. And um, you rock up with your, your washing, you scan your um, accreditation. And if you got in before 10 o'clock, you'd have it back that evening. And um yeah, you can only imagine the amount of laundry they would get. Um, it would always blow my mind that. So, fun fact for the viewers at home, Nas. We got another great photo here. So, this is an area that's open to the public, but Australia took ownership today of this area. Well, I think, Shay, we we're, were allowed on the inside in the green bits, but then there's still international people walking through. Yeah, it's just a walkway. Like we're all just standing there that day. That's like our pre-opening ceremony, ceremony mm. thing. But um, yeah, those were just walkways. The green bit off to the side. That's like another area where we kind of ate and stuff. Just want to zoom in, look at the other apartments here. You can see some flags on the balconies there. Um, Italy, is it? Uh, yeah, I think that's Italy. It looks like there's another country. It might be Italy again. Or no, maybe not. So you can see each each building is sort of um, decorated with different flags or signs. And yeah, you have to agree, Australia was the best looking one there. 
Here we go. So here's some photos from the wheelchair rugby. Uh, Josh, Shay, these might be your photos. Just a team here warming up. I think Shay was uh, lucky to get that one. And um, so we had three training um, sessions in the lead up. I think it was three. And then one practice game. And um, yeah, you know, just getting a feel for the stadium. Uh, Clicking through, and then this is that thoroughfare we're speaking about, Nas. So they've got all the nations with the their flags going down. And at the end of that road to the left, you had um, the international zone for the, all the food hall. And then also that's where you depart. Oh, excellent. That's a great photo. Yeah, it was um, it was warm every day there. <laughs> it was good. But funny enough, while you say it was warm, if I can just um, go up it. Sam, with your racing, mate, it was warm, but then when uh, some of your races, the rain came pretty much. Yeah, it was a real um, contrast. The um, 400 metres was closer to the start of the uh, event, and I think it got to 42 degrees out on the track, yeah. with the sun coming down, so it was a stinker, especially with, you know, thermal regulation problems that spinal cord quads have. Um, but then, yeah opposite to that when i did my 100 it was 22 degrees and peeing down rain so yeah that's yeah, an awesome really segue everything. sam to thermoregulation so this is our recovery setup this is just for the australians in the bottom basement and uh so anyone from team australia could use it and uh to sam's point that he raised uh for some of us quads we use it for both recovery and thermoregulation so to bring that temperature back down and uh when we say ice bars the temperature is generally around 14 to 15 for us. But then uh, for those that are amputees, they might have it a bit colder and also do a longer du duration. Actually, I think, Shay, this is one of your favourite recovery techniques. No. <laughs> I hate the ice bath. <laughs> yeah. Stu, I mean, it wasn't of... too bad there because it was so hot, but yeah, it yeah. was, yeah. No, nah, mate, I'm not an ice bath, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've got much choice with our recovery, so <laughs> we do it. <laughs> So you're in this photo. I'll let you speak to What are we looking it. at here? This is your photo, isn't it, Josh? Yeah, but you're in it. You're to the Am right. I? Yeah. Oh. So what's um, this? This is our room. This is where we lived. Yeah. So your roommate? Um, so back down the apartment. We kind of did some rearranging when we got in there. But um, yeah, this was um, mine, Josh and Harrow's little apartment thing that we lived in for however long we were there. <laughs> yeah. And the bathroom setup was pretty good, wasn't it, Shay? Yeah, it was all pretty accessible. Yeah. And Heated big... toilet seats. Pardon? Heated toilet seats. Yeah, it got the whole whole shebang. The one thing that I love, like, while it looks reasonably basic, as long as it's got an air con, I'm happy, and the air cons were working, and the toilet flushed. So um, <laughs> it, it met the criteria that I needed. So Shay um, got her own room there to the left. Me and uh, Mr. Harrison got to the right. And um, I'm not sure if the next photo now is you can see the – there was the infamous cardboard boxes. Yeah, I was just going to say, having toilets that flush, very, very important. <laughs> I know in Rio that was an issue, and in Athens that was an issue where you could do your thing, but you weren't allowed to flush. So you have to, you, you have to live with what you've done, <laughs> which is not good. So here's that photo of your room, Josh. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is the setup. Like, the beds were, you know, were fine, like, reasonably comfy. They had a bit of memory foam. And you get these dunas. A lot of us um, from past Paralympics and this one, you can take the dunas home. It's a bit of a memento. But um, yeah, as you can see, pretty basic setup. And um, yeah, luckily my um, my bed with the cardboard didn't um, deconstruct. Matt, how'd you go with your room setup? Did you find the beds reasonably uh, accommodating? I'm going to be cheeky. I actually ended up with an electric bed because I didn't want to sleep. Oh, wow. <laughs> Because I, I took my power chair and my shower chair and I, I couldn't get down. Yeah. The height difference was too much from, from the cardboard bed, so I ended up with an electric bed. So you, you had that pre-planned or did you have to adjust when you got there? Um, no, that was pre-planned. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's good. Well, for any other uh, future Paralympians, take note of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, I know for, um, I think it was majority of us, we got to fly business class both there and back. Now that's for health reasons, Nas. So we've got to make sure we get DBTs. And, you know, I'd like to thank Parents Australia for taking that uh, as a caution. Um, but, yeah, you know, having the – that's apple juice. I'm drinking on the way back, I might note. And, oh, um, 
Yeah. That's my tr that's my forearm. Yeah. Looks like quarter to me. Yeah. <laughs> and Sam, do you think it's um I guess both from recovery and also, you know, all the other health issues and just pure enjoyment, how do you find your business class experience? Um, yeah, thanks to Paralympics Australia and Qantas for hooking us up with that. <laughs> um, yeah, very yeah no, it definitely helps. Um, being able to obviously lay down as well in the flatbed and not be sitting upright the whole time is really great, especially for like swelling in your legs. Like you're saying, DVT is quite a big problem for people with limited movement in their legs. Yeah. So it's really good. And especially um, as someone who's kind of suffered from pressure sores from traveling in the past, especially being able to lay down and get off your butt for a little bit is really, really helpful. Yeah. And I guess just for people now, I was just wondering about, you know, if they're on a plane, how do you go? They luckily have aisle chairs that can usher you down and, you know, you can go to the toilets that are, I guess, are reasonably, um, you know, accessible. Yeah, definitely. A lot of people will say, okay, I want to fly or, you know, people that haven't flown before. Uh, it's not an issue, you know, talk yeah. to anyone that's flown before. Uh, you know, any one of us guys, it's pretty straightforward process and yeah and uh, like josh said they've got equipment that's owned by the airlines or the uh, airports like an aisle chair you transfer onto that and you know um, you just sit to, on whichever seat mm -hmm. you're allocated so this is the hotel quar uh, quarantine room so it was it was pretty you know good given you know what i was ex um, expecting and then there's my bag and by the end of the trip nas my bag got much lower because some people may be thinking, you know, what do you take for continents and that, all that sort of stuff? So I think I left with 1,232 catheters that I needed. Well, I was going to talk about that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not, you, you don't just travel with your um, clothes and stuff like that, you know. I mean, um, because you, we got to deal with our bladder and bowel issues. Uh, the number of catheters and all that sort of stuff we had to pack yeah. would have been massive. Mm. Well, no, just on that, Nas, we should do a little um, plug there with the catheters. Uh, that's to Jeanette from Holster. Jane, sorry, from Holster. Jane, yeah, Jane. So she's been a great supporter of um, a lot of the programs that we run, Josh, uh, and, and she's really helpful, you know. Um, yeah. And, so and just plug in there. If anyone had any questions, you know, they can reach out to her. And uh, I was very fortunate. So thanks, Jane. She sent me some um, different products, which had different ways, I guess, you know, um, how would you best say, just different ways to go about it. And I found it very beneficial. So thank you. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, we'll just move on. But yeah, some of the catheters, you know, they're single use or, yeah. um, you know, uh, together with the bag as well, like uh, yeah. all in one, um, yeah. which is really useful, you know. Um, so, yeah, she was able to give you some of those samples. Can I just ask Shay, though, Nas, for was your room exactly the same as mine, Shay? Or like our hotel quarantine rooms? Yeah. Yeah, identical. Yeah, and Nas had this. We had one of our teammates. Um, so the Ibis needed the whole floor, and uh, Andrew was on this one floor. And with four days to go, he got bumped to the Presidente room, or you want to call it, and it was huge. It was well, massive. It was like four times the size. So who bumped him up? He he, he needs to know. buy he them a know, gift. He must know someone. But yeah, I think yeah. someone on his level got COVID. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, there you well. go. This, I love this photo. Now, um, Josh, this is you on the Opera House in Sydney. So have a look at that. that that's so fantastic. And Shay, you'd have, um, or everyone else would have a picture of this. Yeah, everyone it's, it's, should. This really sort of hit home now. It's just, I guess, like you never, I can imagine even, you know, as a kid, even from your injury, did people expect to, you know, to see, you know, that they put your face on the, the sails? It was pretty awesome, Stu. Mm. How about you, Sam? Natalie? It was pretty, it was, it was a pretty, um, I, I think this games, I was, I was struck by how much it affected people back home mm. uh, compared to other games. And I think that was, you know, there was a few reasons for that. I think that the time zone difference was very acceptable. Uh, the coverage was really good. There was a captive audience for a lot of people, but I think that I never, you know, I've always ridden my bike. You know, people have known me for years you know, since I've been riding a bike, and they've always known I've ridden a bike, but they've never actually seen me ride a bike before. Mm -hmm. Let alone seen me race in a in a in a in a, in a, in a Paralympic Games. So, and I never, I never, it sort of hit me that the 
amount of excitement that it was generate the the game just generating back here in Australia. Like that really came home to me when I was um, over there after I'd competed about just the comments on my social media about how that the games as a whole were just lifting people in Australia and how how excited they were for them. That was uh, it really was me. true, yeah, definitely. Um, but you you seen your photo on the Opera House? Stu and the other yeah, guy I've seen mine. Yep. got a copy yep. of it. Uh, not, not maybe somewhere. Oh. <laughs> It'll be in your emails, oh. mate. Hey, uh, can, can I recommend <laughs> this is this is something to keep? Yeah, yeah Paralympics Australia actually sent everyone an email with a copy of their photo. Exactly. So oh, nice to keep as well, and that's I think what made part of it. Um, why I say it was the best game because yeah. the equality in coverage. Um, the support that we got because people got to see us more, got mm. to, you know, be part of our journeys, um, mm. uh, all that sort of thing just made it, yeah, that much better than each just, you know, like obviously Rio wasn't, there was lots of issues there, but um, like London was a fantastic games and it's like, but yeah, and then just having everyone being able to experience it at home and, and the support and things like that, um, that's what just made it the best games for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic, yeah. Got some photos here from Sam. Um, Sam, do you want to, should I just cycle through these or do you want to just talk to what we're looking at? Uh, look, they probably cover most of some of the ones I've kind of been over. It's just kind of <laughs> me in place of Josh. But yeah, it's just kind of the, the uh, Paralympics logo. Yeah. Look at those muscles. Nice. Making me blush, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's, he's uh, so this one. is the athletic stadium. I like yeah. that one. That's good. That's, one. Yeah. that's unreal. It was nice. an absolutely amazing stadium. It was, the fans were really close to the track, so it really felt really close. And it would track... have been amazing to have people in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And the track itself, Sam, I know that can um, vary from stadium to stadium. Yeah, so this was a brand new surface that a company called Mondo that makes track surfaces for major events have come up with and it was really really fast i mean i think wow. we saw that in the olympics for a lot of the guys running but mm. also for the mm. wheelchairs in the paralympics it was it was very quick awesome. yeah just silly question but the, the, does that time represent anything or is that the time of the day that was just a, yeah just this 12 53 <laughs> Okay. Fast, Sammy. Twelve, Case. twelve seconds. Yeah. yeah. Something. Uh, so yeah, similar to Josh, just in that thoroughfare with all the flags, being dramatic naturally. <laughs> and can you see that um, big white tower at the end? Mm. That was actually their garbage disposal. So all of the garbage there, <gasps> it was bigger than the buildings, um, gets put into that and. Um, it's like a giant furnace, but it doesn't create um, pollution, supposedly. Mm. Well, look, uh, I would have never have guessed that. Uh, it just looks like a, another apartment building. Mm. We took everyone was like, what is that? What is that? So we eventually found out, tried to find out what it was, and that's what Unreal. it turned out to be. Well, here's a question. What's that writing on the floor there? Anyone? I'm assuming it just says stop, probably. Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, it was okay. the end of the road, so it's probably a stop sign. <laughs> Okay, and uh, got some more rugby photos uh, of Shay playing Japan there. Saying, "Come on, what, what are you? What are you up to? I've got I'm all over you." <laughs> Is another nice shot. Maybe just also asking some of the guys. Nas, there's a question in there. Are they wondering how long were we actually over there for? Anyone I can't even answer that. that. I don't know how long were we over there for. <laughs> Well, I know for us, Shay, we had a four-day pre-camp and we're over there for about 10 days and then two weeks on the return. Um, Stu, you were going to say something? I was I was in Japan for 18 days. Yeah. See, this is a photo we got in trouble for because we took our masks off. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? But we're not in Japan anymore. <laughs> showing everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good.
Uh, yeah, I think that's the end of the photos. Let me just double check. Yeah. Could, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. A lot of positive feedback coming in the questions, Nas. Thanking everyone for coming along and telling their story. Oh, excellent. That's really good. So let's have a look at what, what we've got. Any, any questions come through? So we're out for you, Nat, to that question that was in the Q&A. How long were you over, I guess, your lead up and in Tokyo for? Um, well, we sort of did a two-week bubble, um, pre-bubble. Oh, wow. Um, but that I was able to do from home because we did it in Queensland. Um, and then we were only there for 10 days in total. And yep. then, of course, the two weeks quarantine. So it was more quarantining than it was games. But mm. we went in four days after the opening ceremony. So, yeah. Got a question here um, about the Olymp uh, Paralympics and World Champs. Is one more exciting than the other or challenging than the other? Uh, they're both, uh, you know, high level competitions, but there's a certain, you know, element of mystique around the Paralympics. It's only once every four years, and it's kind of the ultimate event. So, you know, World Champions. World championships come around every year, pretty much. So, um, yeah, mm. the, the once in the four year, it's the ultimate competition. There's a lot and more pressure, and yeah, the world champs are for each individual sport generally. So it's just your sport there. Whereas the Paralympics, it's every sport, and you can. And we didn't get to go this time, but usually you can get to go and watch sports that you you don't know a lot about, mm. and and it's the pinnacle of every sport. So. It's absolutely Paralympics are the best. Um, someone made a comment here, Duke. Um, so it must have been a discussion we were having before. Um, it's called stalking Sam. So, so it must have been about a discussion we had earlier. Um, a QLM made a comment, Agitos. Again, it might have been about something we were talking about earlier. Um, we just answered the question Josh mentioned. How long were you guys there? Everyone was there at, for different times, weren't they? They had to get there just before the event and uh, return soon after the event was um, finished. You couldn't wait for the closing ceremony, unfortunately. That was another thing that sort of people missed out on. Um, Jane said, thanks, Josh and Nas. Nas, you're a legend, she said. No, nah, I just made that last Yeah, bit. I think we all knew that one. So, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> um, what else we got? Tim. And uh, these are great picks. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. Thanks, Tim. Thank you for all your time today. It's been great to hear your experience firsthand. I'm sorry I have to scoot for work. Uh, thank you from Stephanie Smith. Uh, I know the session is recorded. I'll watch it back again tonight. Thanks again, Stephanie. So I think what we're looking for now is, is wrapping up and thanking everyone for coming, Nas, aren't we? Yeah, so I just wanted to make sure we went through all the comments and uh, if there was any other questions. So it looks like um, that's all we've got. So I think, yeah, we'll wrap up now unless anyone wants to make any comments, say anything before we close off. Um, a couple of more thank yous coming through. I look forward to watching several of these people dominate in Paris, Nas. Yeah. While I eat olives and uh, have a vino in my hand. Mm -hmm. Don't act like he won't be there, Joe. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. Rosemary said, thank you very much. Very interested hearing firsthand uh, what it was like and seeing the photos. Watched a lot of the Par Paralympics and loved it. All the best for Paris. Hopefully a more COVID-free environment. So I agree and I think everyone... Um, it's the same way. Awesome. So any finishing comments before we close up? Thank you, everyone, for joining us, I think. Thanks, yeah. Jay, Sam, Nat, Stu. Yeah, no, so, yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, as Josh said, Shay, Stuart, Natalie, Sam, Josh, and Nas, thanks for... <laughs> presenting um yeah if anyone's got any questions down the track and um, please um yeah get in touch with aqa and we'll put you in touch with any of the athletes here uh, how you can be involved or if you've got any other further questions so thanks again everyone yes, um, thank you
Hey guys, have a good afternoon. See you. Ciao. See you later. Ciao. Ciao. Bye.